uh, here with uh, Reading Greek Tragedy Online. Uh, today we're reading Euripides Hecuba. Uh, we have with us today Eunice Roberts, Evelyn Miller, Tamika Chavis, Taj Bello, Tim DeLapp, Carlos Bellato, and our special guest, uh, Toff Marshall. Um, so this play is rapidly becoming one of my favorites. It starts out with action not many people know about. And that's a young son of Priam, Polydorus, has been sent abroad to Thrace, where King Polymester was, Polymestor was supposed to take care of him uh, and protect him uh, during the Trojan War. But when Troy fell, Polymestor killed him to keep the gold Priam sent his support. Now, this is a different Polydorus from the one we meet in the Iliad. A boy who's still Priam's youngest son, but this child was born with a consort named Laothoe, who was speared in the gut by Achilles when running in the front lines. Now, Achilles also appears in this play in the shadows. He's demanded the burial of um, Polydorus, but also demanded the sacrifice of his sister Polyxena. So this play splits into two parts and centers around the experience and the emotion of Hecuba, the queen of Troy, Priam's wife, and the mother of uh, purportedly 50 or more children. Um, we find out um, as we follow her about her experiences in war, her suffering, um, and then her desire for revenge. So the play undergoes a major transformation as we as the audience follow Hecuba from her lament through um, her uh, despair and rooting all along and willing her to complete her aims. Um, so we'll start with the first scene and then come back to talk. I am old. I am plagued by bad dreams. Once your queen, I am frail, a worn hag you must lead from the huts. My dear friends, sister slaves, help me walk, hold my hand, let me lean on your arms like a staff, bear me up. My own legs are too weak to support me. Oh, lightning of Zeus, tell me why I am snatched from my sleep by these spectres of dread, goddess earth from whose womb these nocturnal invasions emerge like the stirring of bats. I recoil from these nightmares, oh, you underworld gods. Please protect Polydorus, my anchor and last of my house, who abides in this Thracian domain in the home of a friend. Oh, the horrors I dreamed. I still shudder with fear. Find Cassandra or Helenus, ask them to read these fantasms and explain the young doe that was torn from my lap and destroyed by a wolf with bloody jaws. So Hecuba starts to play after the ghost of her son has appeared and sort of introduced us to the action. Um, and it's a pretty powerful um, beginning, and it builds on some of Euripides' interests interest in other plays. So Hecuba does not appear just in this play. Um, Toph, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about both some of the background in the play historically, um, but also some of the performance issues that you see um, in the beginning. Sure. Uh, I love this play. I think it's really exciting. And, and um, part of that last imagery about the, uh, the, the animals uh, in her dreams give us a different view of uh, the ghost that we've just seen. In terms of the stagecraft, the play uh, poses a lot of problems and, and interesting choices. Where does the ghost appear when Hecuba is there? Is it the ghost appearing? Is it her dream that we see? Uh, and the play is not concerned to answer any of that. It just gives us this multiple sets of imagery um, that we as audience members sort of pull together in order to create a composite. Um, I think the series has already done Trojan Women, um, which is set sort of on the same weekend. It's like Hecuba's worst weekend ever. But we, whereas in that play, she has three encounters uh, with different women, um, with uh, her daughter, uh, her daughter-in-law, and then Helen, her uh, son's living girlfriend. Um, in this one, it's three men, and we see her encounter Odysseus, and then Agamemnon, and then Polynester, and she 
gains power with each one. She starts off weak and broken. Um, she doesn't have the authority to work against Odysseus, but she's growing in strength, as you were saying. So sort of structurally, there's a nice antithesis to what we see in Trojan Women, which was written about probably uh, five to 10 years later. So, and there's, there really is this difference as she grows during the play. And one of the things we talk about is the historical context that sort of gives breath to these moments. Um, and so, I, I, you know, 424 BCE is when this play is to have been um, performed. And this is after the Athenians had sort of positioned themselves, oh, you know, dominantly over the Spartans and around the time when they start to lose ground again. Um, how, how do you think that this sort of relates to sort of the Athenian populace and their experiences in, uh, in this particular year? That's a really tough question to answer. Um, again, when you, know, you look at these things, uh, the play will have been pitched nine or 10 months earlier. So if we accept 424, then it's happening in 425 that the pitch is. But really the date uh, could be as late as 420. Um, and uh, we honestly don't know. But it's a time when uh, Athens uh, thinks it, it's riding the crest of the wave, I think, of, uh, of, of, of the war. And Euripides is inviting us to uh, map ourselves, us in the audience as presumptive Athenian citizens, onto captured enemies. And uh, he does the same thing in Trojan women. Um, there it's a much bleaker result, I think, but he is asking us to identify uh, I'll say implicitly with the Spartans. I think the Greeks are coded as the Athenians here. The Trojans are uh, coded as uh, Sparta and her allies. And Euripides is, is asking for sympathy and uh, emotional engagement and pity for what the other side is going through. So something to think about then for what we see later on um, is what it means to ask for sympathy um, when the other side comes uh, straight for you to kill you in your home. Um, but we we can wait for that. Uh, so uh, part of the background that we that we might have glossed over in this um, is that Hecuba at this moment has been awarded already in in sort of the plot of the Trojan Women as a slave to Odysseus, um, and she's about to learn about the fate of her daughter Polyxena. So after the scene we just saw, the chorus enters and is comprised of enslaved Trojan women. They tell Hecuba about this news of the sacrifice of Polyxena's daughter. And this is a really ancient tale, it seems, because there are vase images at least of several generations before Euripides showing this. But the images we see, if you sort of Google uh, sacrifice of Polyxena, is very different from the scene we'll see here. Um, so Odysseus has argued for this death um, instead of Cassandra's um, and, and appears and tells Hecuba, Hecuba to beg Agamemnon for mercy. Hecuba mourns and hearing, uh, upon hearing her mother's despair, Polyxena enters and that'll be our next scene. The distress in your voice, your sharp cries of dismay, dearest mother, have flushed me from the tent like a bird. What on earth is your news? Oh, my child, my own lamb. Why this chill in your tone? I am afraid. Don't stop now. No, now I am afraid. I hear such fear in your voice. My child, child of a wretched mother. And why do you say this? Tell me. Because they have voted, the Greeks, to kill you on the tomb of Achilles. Alas, that you utter these unspeakable woes. I must speak the unspeakable, child, though it tears me to pieces. You must know. Sad mother of mine, what more can you take? Such outrage and woe abound, it's too much. Defenceless myself, I can't defend you, can't lighten your grief. Alas, I must die. Be slain like a lamb and you'll have to watch it in pain. I'll be snatched away and impaled. My torment will end. I'll lie with the dead. Oh, mother, for you, I weep and lament. And here comes Odysseus now, Hecuba, hurrying to tell you something. Hecuba, I think you know the army's will and verdict. I'll state it anyway. The Greeks have voted to offer you up your daughter on Achilles' tomb. 
They've authorized me to be her guard and escort. Neoptolemus will preside over the rites of sacrifice. Now be sensible about this. Don't make us drag you off by force or come to blows. The state of affairs is difficult, I know, but accept your lot. Hard luck is best met with level-headedness and expediency. Oh, dear gods, here it comes. A pitched battle sick with groans and anything but dry of tears. I didn't die when and where I should have, but in my suffering, mighty Zeus spares me yet, miserable as I am, to live and suffer more. If a slave may ask a free man some harmless questions, nothing out of hand. I assure you nothing with teeth, then you, Odysseus, shall be free to answer and I to hear what you have to say. Within these parameters, may I speak? Permission granted. Ask away. Remember how you came to Ilium, a spy cloaked in beggar's rags, with blood from your self-inflicted wounds blurring your eyes, masking your face, staining you Trojan? I do. The memory cuts deep. How when Helen spotted you, she told me alone. I thought I was sunk. A goner. Remember the beggar you were then. How you grabbed my knees. My hands grew numb, holding your robes in that death grip. And I spared you, freed you. I see the sun today because of you. When you were my slave, remember how you said? Hecuba, I said whatever it took to stay alive. Aren't you shameless in this conduct of yours? You yourself just admitted the mercy you got from me, and now you do me such evil in return? Oh, God, save us from politicians and demagogues like you, who don't care what harm you do as long as the multitudes are pleased and the applause is loud. But tell me, what counseled expediency led them to cast their ballots in favor of killing my child? What in your so-called necessity requires this brutal murder at a tomb where by custom oxen ought to die? Does the ghost's thirst for revenge justify his demand for human slaughter? Polyxena has done no harm to Achilles. Rather, he should have asked for Helen's sacrifice since she destroyed him by steering him to Troy. Or if beauty is prerequisite in this tribute, logic still exempts us and points to Helen. She's the epitome after all, the absolute knockout, the stunner, the dazzling mantrap who wronged Achilles far more than we. And thus, my case for justice against the ghosts. Now, hear my claim on your gratitude. As you yourself have readily confirmed, when our positions were reversed in Troy, you fell at my feet, begging for your life. You clasped my hand and touched my aging cheek here. But now it's my turn to fall, clasping your hand, touching your cheek, just so. To ask that you return the favor and spare my child. Please, I beg you, don't take my daughter from me. Let her live. Haven't enough died already? All I've lost lives on in her. She is my solace, she is my staff, my nurse, my guide. She is my Troy. Those with power should use that power carefully. Those in luck should not assume that luck will hold, as I well know. Once I was powerful and lucky, a queen, but no more. A day obliterated all. Odysseus, I implore you, by your bearded chin, have pity on me. Reconvene the army, persuade them it's wrong to kill the very women you spared because you pitied them in Troy. Remind your men that Greek laws pertaining to murder protect enslaved and free alike without distinction. You have the power, the authority and the lucky eloquence 
but even if you babble or stutter, your esteemed reputation, like a steady wind, will swell the sail of your words, carrying them farther than those of blowhards and lesser men. Who could be so calloused as to remain unmoved, hearing your sad complaints and mournful refrains of abundant woe? A prefatory caveat, Hecuba. Just because I make political speeches doesn't mean that I must therefore be your enemy. So don't in anger misconstrue me so. First off, I acknowledge unconditionally your claim on my gratitude. You saved my life. And by the gods, I owe you. I stand ready to honor my debt by saving your life, but my public vow to the Greek troops I must also stand by. And that is to reward our best warrior with Polyxena, your daughter. It's an invalid premise, you see, to think that these two lives, yours, hers, can be interchanged. Furthermore, our cities will fail if noble and devoted soldiers earn no greater returns than do lesser men. Achilles deserves honor and tribute more than anyone. He died for Greece and by the gods we owe him. What conduct is more shameless than enlisting a man's good and faithful service while he lives only to throw him to the dogs when he's dead? Well then, and if we had to go to war again, would we have troops ready and willing to deploy? Or would men think, why bother? Better to lie low and save my own skin. Imagine what adverse effects dishonoring the dead would have on recruiting efforts, on public perception, on morale. For me, a few essential crumbs will suffice while I'm alive but I want the full out display of honors and commemorations when I die, a worthy tomb to make this life worthwhile. That's the thing that lasts. Third, you complain how you've suffered. Well, we Greeks have suffered too. Our old women, our old men are no less wretched than yours. Our young brides are likewise widowed of fine grooms who sleep in Trojan dust instead their marriage beds. Just as we endure these hardships, so can you. And if you think I'm wrong to honor the legacy of a great warrior like Achilles, then go ahead and call me callous. The barbaric way you foreigners use your friends and disrespect the dead, I say keep it up. That way Greece stays on top and you people get the fate that you deserve. Witness here how the violence of war enslaves, forcing its captives to endure the unendurable. Oh, daughter, all my arguments against your murder were useless. Feeble puffs of air accomplishing nothing. If you have more skill than your mother, use it now. Like the nightingale, sing out all your notes or you will lose your life. Fall prostrate on this man's knee and persuade him. He has children too, I know. You may yet move him to pity. I see you, Odysseus, how you've hidden your right hand in your cloak and turned your face away so I can't touch your hand or beard in supplication. But you have nothing to worry about. I'll follow you to Achilles' tomb, both out of necessity and because I wish to. I want to die. I won't grovel for my life like some lowly coward of a woman. Why should I live? My father was king of Troy, ruler of all Phrygians. I was born royalty. And I was reared to expect I'd marry my choice of kings, exciting rivalry over whose home and hearth I'd grace as a bride. I was mistress of the Idaeans, centre of their attention, godlike, except in my mortality. Now I'm a slave. I am infatuated with death. Imagine, some cruel-minded master could buy me for money. Me, the daughter of Priam, sister of Hector and many others, and take me to his house 
force me to cook for him, to sweep and tend the shuttle, to work day after day while my bed, once thought fit for rulers, is polluted by some bought slave. No, it will not happen. That life is inconceivable. While the light in my eyes is still free, I yield it up, giving my body to Hades. So lead me, Odysseus. Take me to my death. I see no reason to hope for or believe in anything better. And mother, don't you interfere and help me instead. I would rather die than suffer the shame of wearing slavery's yoke around my neck. The signs of good breeding are always impressive, but nobility is even more noble when it's deserved. You've spoken well, my daughter, but there is pain in that good speaking. Odysseus, I understand that Peleus's son must be granted his sacrifice and that your reputation must be preserved. Here's how to accomplish both without killing this girl. Lead me to the pyre and appease the ghost by killing me. Indeed, I, who gave birth to Paris, who with his bow slew the great Achilles, should not be spared. Achilles didn't ask for your death. Old woman, but for hers. Then slaughter me with my daughter. That gives the earth and Achilles' corpse twice as much blood to drink. That's unnecessary. Your daughter's death is enough. Believe me when I say, I wish this one death didn't have to be. Then I must die with her. Excuse me, I'm not aware that I was taking orders. I'll cling to her like Ivy. Not if you obey those wiser than you. She's my daughter, I won't let her go. And I won't go away, so take your leave of her. Mother, do as I say. Wait, Odysseus, have some patience with a parent's understandable fury. Mother, listen to me. Don't try to fight those who have you in their power. Do you want to be shoved around to have your fragile, aged skin scraped and torn when you fall to the ground? To risk losing your dignity, being dragged off by some young soldier? No, mother, it would be unseemly. Instead, dear unhappy one, give me your sweet hand and lay your cheek to mine. Now, for the very last time, I see the bright circle of the sun. Now I say my final words to you. Oh, one who carried me in her womb and bore me. And now I go. Dear child, how I still leash to daylight will mourn for you. Unmarried, not royally wed as I should have been. You're pitiful child and I'm a wretched woman. In Hades' darkness, I will die alone. Oh, gods, what shall I do? Where turn to end my life? I, born in freedom, to die a slave. And I, bereft of fifty children. Mother, what do you want me to tell my brother Hector and Priam, my father, your husband? Tell them how wretched I am. Oh, breasts that suckled me. Oh, daughter who grieves me with an untimely, unhappy fate. Farewell, mother, and say farewell to Cassandra for me. Others may farewell, but not your mother. Now lead me away, Odysseus, with a veil shrouding my head. My mother's grief has melted my heart, and I have melted hers. Oh, sunlight, I will savour you in the short time left between this moment and the sword at Achilles' tomb. <sighs> I faint, my legs dissolve. Polyxena, stay with me. Reach out your hand, grab hold of mine. Don't go, daughter, don't leave me childless. Let me die, my friends. So with that, we move to the next part of the play. The Polyxena is taken away. Um, her uh, sacrifice is later described uh, to the audience. Um, but for the time being, uh, Toph, I'm, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about the structure of the play 
up to this point and, and how it relates to other plays. Because I've heard some people say um, that the structure of this play is completely surprising and not at all standard. Um, I, th I think the, the surprise is going to come uh, for our next little bit. But right now what we're seeing is something that's completely, uh, I'll say, straightforward. We've just had an agon, uh, two long speeches uh, from different points of view. We see Hecuba and her attitude towards killing Polixena, and then we get Odysseus. And Odysseus is a weasel. Um, he's hiding his hand. He's not willing to honor reciprocity. He's not willing to honor his previous obligations. Um, the only reason he's caring about uh, Achilles' ghost is because he wants nice to him himself. Uh, bad luck on that one, unfortunately. But uh, he's, he's, he's so self-motivated um, and so uninterested in personal connections. He talks about the army. He talks about all these things. We didn't mention it earlier, but there is actually a second ghost at the beginning of this play, and that's the ghost of Achilles. We see the ghost of uh, Polydorus, but we're told about the ghost of Achilles, who has demanded Polixena for, uh, so that he has a bride in this sort of unparalleled and unexpected uh, ritual um, so that, you know, he won't get lonely and he'll get an honor prize as well. But oh. this agon structure sets the two views against one another. And then in comes Polixena. And well, what do we think of Polixena? I think we're, she, she's not a straightforward character. And I think she's often taken to be one. Um, everything she says is noble, but it's also completely selfish as well. And I think that uh, she, in her mind, she's a good person. But while the words are good, I think she is abandoning her mother here. Um, the Greeks have this moral uh, dictum to help friends harm enemies. Simple, straightforward, runs throughout the fifth century. And here she is helping her enemy and hurting her mom. Hey, so. Um, I I think it's interesting to think about her characterization in contrast um, and, and, you know, um, complement with some of the other characters we've seen. And so I'm struck first by, so the difference in the decision that Iphigenia makes, right? If we're thinking about, so the centrality of a sacrificed daughter to not just this myth, but Euripides plays, but then also the decision-making that she talks through, like she talks through what her life is like in a way that we saw last week with Ion who wants to stay at Delphi because he's gonna be so constrained and alienated um, in Athens. Um, so what do we make of this return to the daughter sacrifice theme? Well, the Euripides has a whole bunch of child sacrifice plays and this is the first one. So I think our temptation is to see a larger pattern here, mm. but at the moment we haven't had others, you know, we don't have Ion, we don't have Iphigenia, no, Eur Euripides Iphigenia, and we don't have, uh, but uh, we do have the, all, all these other ones. But I do wonder if in the background we have that sort of foundational myth of Athens of the sacrifice of the daughters of Kekrops um, sort of lingering in the audience's mind. Am I looking for patterns that aren't there, or do you see the? Well, I think we, 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 the, the one that we've got before this actually uh, does draw on that in Children of Heracles. Uh, we've got one that's clearly drawing on Kekrops. Um, I'm not sure uh, that one makes the pattern. And I think Euripides is trying to do something different with Polixena here. Okay. She, is, she is looking for escape. She doesn't want to be a slave. She loves her noble life and mm -hmm. rightly doesn't want to go to Greece the way some of the chorus members later say that they do. Um, and it, so contrasts, got, it contrasts really powerfully with, with her mother's nobility and acquiescence. I, I think it does. And so uh, after we had the two major speeches, we start getting the stichomythia, another structural element um, where Hecuba and Odysseus are going back and forth and then Polixena cuts in mm -hmm. and she takes over Odysseus's argument and starts arguing with her mother. She's not, she's, she's not helping her mom accomplish her mom's ends she is taking Odysseus's side saying actually yeah no this works for me pretty well 
Um, and you've already mentioned the messenger speech that comes on. It's a Greek, it's Talthibius who comes on, and he thinks her dying is just spectacular. So the Greeks uh, are all in favor of, of Polixena dying, and Polixena is taking their side and not the side of her mom. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I think that makes it more ambiguous. While, while she believes she's doing the right thing, I think we're open to questioning it. And I think the play entitles us to do that too, because we were told that the winds would start blowing once Polixena is killed and they don't. Um, the entire second half of the play can take place because Polixena's sacrifice hasn't accomplished anything. Um, they're still not able to sail. They're still marooned uh, on the shores of Thrace waiting for a good wind to to blow them back. So uh, we've got this contrast with the situation that we know uh, from Iphigenia, where there, the adverse winds require a princess to be sacrificed in order to go to Troy. There's an apparent parallelism with uh, enemy princess being sacrificed to allow them to depart, but the parallelism breaks down pretty quickly. Whereas before it was to uh, Artemis, for whatever reason. Um, here it's to the ghost of Achilles. Uh, so he gets someone to sleep with in the underworld. So, so the apparent parallelism, I think Euripides is tearing it apart. So, um, and, and that's all within Euripides' wheelhouse, right? He likes to take myth and sort of press it till it breaks. Uh, before we move on to this scene, uh, I think one of the neat things about the, our Zoom performance context is it mimics what happens in ancient performance, which is that you have a static background, right? You sort of stay in the same place de despite the action of the words. Um, so you, can you give, so we have radically different scenes that we've already talked about and that we're about to see, but they're all happening on the same stage with the same scene. So can you set the scene a little for the audience before we move on? Well, I think uh, in the theater of Dionysus, um, you know, we, we know that we're in a festival context. There's thousands of us sitting uh, in, in this festival looking at uh, the orchestra, which, uh, you know, might be 20, 25 meters across. Uh, whether it's a circle, we don't know at this time. Uh, whether there's, you know, but we're sitting on wooden benches. Um, there's a wooden stage building behind us, the Skene. And I'll say... 25, 30 years ago, I think it would standard to assume that there'd be like painted panels coming out. Um, I think uh, enough work has been done in the past 30 years that has shown that even that is a hangover from, I'll say the scholar's expectation of naturalism out of 19th century theater. Um, so we don't need to have any particular representation of Agamemnon's tent, which is the setting of this particular play or of uh, the Temple of Apollo at Delphi or whatever it is, we've got a default building. Um, and uh, the words of the play conjure up the location for us. Um, it's, it's verbal painting. And we, in the audience, uh, are, uh, we become trained to look past all this and and imagine the place where we are. I actually think it's a very bare set um, and a very minimalistic set. Uh, so we don't need to see, you know, the smoke of Troy rising in the background or anything like that. We've got words that tell us we see that. Yeah. And I think that's enough. Um, so here we've got Agamemnon's tent. Uh, it is the same, it, it looks not unlike uh, what would have been on stage 30, 35 years earlier for the Oresteia. Um, and and uh, it looks no different than the Royal Palace would have looked. Uh, we just know that we're in this makeshift tent. I think one, I think that fact is something we haven't fully appreciated, that the sameness of the context and sort of the ritual really adds to the experience of these words, really supercharges them. Um, 
And I don't, I don't know if we're replicating that, but we're giving ourselves an opportunity to do so. So as you said, yeah. so the scene changes and part of what helps us move from one emotional moment to the next is the chorus. So the chorus comes in after the scene we saw and then uh, Talthibius comes and uh, tells Hecuba the news of the sacrifice of Polyxena. And one of the things that, they, that he mentions is that she refused to be touched. She wanted to go to the altar alone, which is again, probably Euripides playing with the tradition because the images we see are her being bound tightly and held over an altar. So um, Talthibius goes to get uh, Polyxena's corpse so that Hecuba can prepare a funeral and the chorus mourns with her and then the um, um, enslaved woman brings it on stage. But the body she brings on stage, surprise, is not Polyxena, it's Polydorus. Hecuba's slaughtered son, who's washed up on shore. And at this point, the audience has known about his death, but the actors have not. Hecuba and the chorus lament again, but they're cut short by the entrance of Agamemnon. And Hecuba and Agamemnon have their own little CSI thrace going on as they try to figure out what <laughs> happened to him. And Hecuba pleads with him to allow her to take vengeance on Polymestor for her son's murder. Agamemnon, who's sort of a clueless guy at the beginning of this play agrees to aid her by not doing anything at all, promising just to stand by there and let her go. The chorus sings briefly to flashback on the sacking of Troy, and then our villain of the moment, Polymestor, enters. My dearest Hecuba, wife of my late friend Priam, how I pity you and your ruined Troy. And now your precious Polyxena dead. It's just too much. Oh, what can we count on in this life? Nothing, I say. Not reputation or good fortune. The gods make it all pitch and yaw, back and forth, until we're seasick and confused enough to worship them. <laughs> but what help is any of this with your loss? Are you bothered I haven't been to visit you before now? I came here as fast as I could, Hecuba. It just so happened that I was inland, seeing about Thracian business when you arrived here. As a matter of fact, I was just setting out to see you when your servant arrived and gave me your message. I'm mortified for you to see me in this state, Polymester. I've fallen so low since we last met. I'm too ashamed now to look you in the eye. So don't think of it as hostility toward you, Polymester. Besides, it's not customary for a woman to meet a man's gaze. Indeed. No offence taken, my dear. Now, how can I be of service? What are the pressing matters your message spoke of? I have some information to share with you and your sons, but it's private. Would you ask your attendants to leave us for a while? Go away. I'm safe here. Hecuba is my friend and the Greek army is well disposed to me. But tell me, how may a fortunate man such as I help an unfortunate friend? First things first. Tell me about the child Priam and I gave to you for safekeeping. How is he? Does he live? Alive and well, I assure you. In his, in his case anyway, you're in luck. Oh, dearest friend. Your words speak to your worth. Is there anything else you wish to know? Does he still remember me, his mother? Does he? <laughs> he even tried to come here secretly to see you. The gold he brought with him from Troy, is it safe? Quite safe, under lock and key in my palace. Guard it well. I hope it isn't a burdensome temptation. Not at all. I'm content to enjoy the wealth I already have. Do you know why I've sent for you and your sons? I don't. You were just going to tell me. There are. Oh, beloved friend, you are so dear to me. Yes, yes, go on. What is it we must know? Ancient vaults. But Priam's gold. And you want me to convey this to your son? That's it. You are an upright man. Why do my sons need to be here? If something happened to you, they would need to know of this. I see what you mean. Smart thinking. Do you know Athena's temple in Troy where it once stood? Is that where the gold is? How can it be found now? 
look for sheer outcroppings of black rock. Is there anything I need to know? Yes, the treasure I smuggled out of Troy. Can you keep it for me? You have it with you? Where, in your gown, or have you hidden it? It's under a pile of plunder in these tents. Here? This is the Greek encampment. Female captives are housed in separate quarters. Is it safe to go inside? Are there any men around? No men, only us women. But hurry, because the Greeks are restless to weigh anchor and sail for home. Once our business is finished, you can take your sons back to the place you house my son. You have yet to pay the price, but you will, like a man stumbling into foul bilge water, or swept from shore and drowning in the undertow. As the waves cover your head, you'll see how your life is just a loan that's come due. Death is the payment the gods demand. Where justice and the gods converge, there's maelstrom. Your greed for gold leads you down the road to hell. The wretched me. That never held a sword will cut your life away. I'm blind, blinded of my eyes, light. Did you hear the Thracian? Why is he screaming, my friend? Oh me, my children! You floated them! Something new and terrible has been done inside the tent. Run, will you? But you won't escape. I'll tear this tent down with my own hands. See that? It looks like something heavy thrown against the tent wall. What is all the clatter and commotion? Should we rush in? What should we do? Should we break down the door? Crisis calls. Hurry now. Hercubia needs us. That's right, smash it all. Rage and roar, break down the door. Nothing will bring your sight back or let you see your sons alive again. I've killed them. Did you really do the things you say, Hecuba? Have you taken down the Thracian? Just watch. In a minute, you'll see him come stumbling out, blind and flailing. You'll see his sons, whom I killed with the help of these excellent Trojan women. He's paid his debt. I've had my revenge. And here he comes, just as I said. I'll get out of the way of his Thracian fury. Where go? Where stand? Run? Where? A beast on all fours, hard on the trail of my prey. Where? Here? This way, that way, to corner those murderous Trojan hags. Where are you, hags? Where did the witches go? God of sun, cure my bloody eyes. Give me light. Hist, I hear their footsteps. I smell them. But where? Oh, gods, to leap, to gorge on their flesh and bones, rabid for blood. Vengeance is mine. Where now? My children deserted. Mm -mm. Torn apart by those bacants of hell, slaughtered a gory meal for dogs, a wild thing thrown out on a mountain. Where can I stand? Where turn? Where go? Run for my lair, sail like a ship, my cloak, a sail unfurling. Run, guard my sons. Tormented man, in the grips of unbearable suffering, brought on by your unbearable deeds, a heavy-handed god weighs you down with punishments. Help me. Aid, hear me, you Thracians. Soldiers, bring your spears. Horsemen, your, use your spurs. Come to me, son of Atreus. Help, help, I cry, help. For the God's sake, where are you? Do you hear? I need help. These women, they've... Won't someone help me? These women have destroyed me. They've weapons. My sons, murder, butchery, help. I need help. Oh, gods, the horrors, where can I run? Where can I go? Wings, God, give me wings. Let me fly to the heavens into the light of Orion or Sirius, or in my wretchedness I must plunge into the frothing black chasms of Hades. Who can blame this man for wanting to die, for thinking death the cure for so much pain? I came when I heard shouts. Echo ricochet off the rock, spreading uproar through the army. If we didn't know firsthand that Troy's towers had fallen to Greek spears, the commotion would have caused some concern. 
I know that voice. Oh, my dear friend, Agamemnon, see what I suffer. Dear God, oh, wretched man, who has ruined you? Who gouged your eyes and blinded you? Who killed your sons? Whoever, whoever it was truly hated all of you. It was Hecuba. She did all of this. She and her women, they destroyed me. No, worse. You, Hecuba? Is this true? Did you do these horrible things? What, is Hecuba here? Where? Show me so I can rip her apart, tear her flesh into pieces with my very own hands. Stop, buddy, mister. What is wrong with you? For God's sake, let me go. I will shred her limb by limb. Enough. No more savagery. I will hear your case and hers and judge you both fairly. I'll speak. There was a boy named Polydorus, Hecuba's youngest son. His father, Priam, brought him to me to live when Troy seemed in danger of falling. Yes, I did kill Polydorus, I admit it. But I'll tell you why, so you'll see that it was well and wisely planned. I reasoned that if this child survived, he would regather and refound Troy. And if the Greeks found out this heir to the Trojan throne still lived, they would set out a second expedition, devastate Thrace in the process, and we'd bear the collateral damage of your battles once again. But Hecuba, hearing her son was dead, lured me here with reports of treasure hidden in Troy's ruins. She said we might be overheard, so she coaxed us into the tent, my sons and me. They sat us on a couch. I was surrounded by many hands, some to the left, some to the right. Everyone seemed friendly. Some women sat beside me, exclaiming over my robe. They held the cloth up to the light and praised the craftsmanship of the weave. Others admired my spear and shield, and before I knew it, my weapons were gone. Young mothers fussed over my sons, fondling them, bouncing them in their arms, passing them from hand to hand until my boys were out of reach. Then out of the blue, these placid women, these mothers pulled daggers from their robes and stabbed my sons to death. While other women pinned me down so that I couldn't move, I tried to raise my head, but they pulled me down by my hair. I couldn't free my arms because so many of them pressed against me. And then, oh, agony, they pulled off their brooches and pierced my eyes until the blood ran thick. Then they ran away. I sprang up after them like a raging animal, bashing and banging my way along the walls, searching for them, hunting them. These are the things I've suffered in looking out for your interests, Agamemnon, killing your enemy. Let me tell you, if anyone in the past has spoken ill of women or speaks so now or will speak so in the future, I'll sum it up for him. Neither sea nor land has ever produced a more monstrous creature than woman. I say this for a fact. Don't blame us all solely on the basis of your woes. Agamemnon, never in the affairs of men should the tongue have more power than facts. Rather, when someone acts well, he should speak well, and if the opposite, his words should be rotten. Glib rhetoric may win us over for a while, but in the end, the smooth talkers die foully. So much for my prologue to you, Agamemnon. Now to deal with him. You claim that by killing my son, you saved the Greeks from another quagmire of war. What a lie! Tell me, you scum. What possible help could a barbarian like you be to the Greeks? Whose favor were you currying in your eager zeal, trying to marry into a family to help a relative. I remember. You said the Greeks were going to trample all over your country's crops. Who on earth do you think will believe that? I'll tell you the real reason. It was the gold. You killed my son so you could get your hands on his gold. If not, 
then why is it that while Troy still flourished, while its towers remained intact, while Priam lived and while Hector's spear thrived, and you really wanted to help out Agamemnon, how come you didn't kill Polydorus then, or at least turn him over as a threat? Instead, you waited until you saw the smoke rising from the city that told you our fortunes had turned for the worse. Only then did you kill the guest you had taken into your home, who sat helpless at your hearth. Here's more proof of your evil. If you really had the interests of the Greeks at heart, as you claim, why didn't you give them the gold right away? That gold, you say, isn't yours, but Agamemnon's. They were in desperate need then, exhausted from battle, just barely scraping by in a foreign land. But no, even now you're hoarding that treasure. It's locked up and well guarded in your house, as you told me yourself. And another thing, if you had taken care of my child as you ought to have and kept him safe, you'd earn respect and honour and worthy fame. Hard times prove the honest friendship of good men, while prosperity always has friends. If at some point you were in need and Polydorus was doing well, my child would have been a great treasury for you. As it is, you have no friend in Agamemnon there. Your gold is gone, as are your children, and you must live on as you are. Agamemnon, if you side with Polymester, you endorse evil. This man has betrayed all trust. He has broken the laws of man and God. He is faithless, irreverent, and thoroughly corrupt. If you acquit him, what then do your actions say about you? Just causes make fertile soil for strong arguments. It pains me to see it in judgment of other troubles, but I must. What kind of leader would I be if I push this case aside, having agreed to take it up? So, here's my verdict. Polymestor, you are guilty of murder. Clearly, it wasn't for my sake or the Greeks that you killed Polydorus when he was a guest in your home, but for the sake of getting his gold. Your rhetoric exudes the oily panic of a guilty man uncovered. You have misconstrued facts to put yourself in a more favorable light. Maybe you think killing a guest, in this case, a child who's been put in your care, is a smaller matter in the larger scheme of things. But we Greeks think of it as heinous murder. How could I rule you innocent and maintain a shred of credibility? I can't. You committed a brutal crime. Be prepared, therefore, for a justly brutal punishment. Ah, how can it be? I'm defeated by a woman, a slave, condemned and punished by my inferior. But isn't that just since you've committed crimes? Oh, my children. Oh, my eyes. You're suffering. What of it? I, too, lost a child. Do you enjoy abusing me, you monster? Shouldn't I be enjoying my revenge on you? But you won't be soon, when the sea spray takes me on a one-way trip to Greece, swallows you up as you fall from the masthead. And who does the honours of pushing me into the salty brink? You yourself will climb the ship's mast. Will I grow wings on my back or what? You'll be transformed into a dog, a bitch with fiery eyes. How do you know of this metamorphosis of mine? Our Thracian prophet Dionysus told me. Well, he failed to warn you of your own fate. If he had, you'd never have tricked me. So will I live or will I die? You'll die. And when you do, your tomb will be called. What? Hecuba's doghouse? Kynosima, the sign of the wretched bitch. A bitch's grave for a landmark and warning for sailors. It makes no difference to me. I've had my revenge. Your child, Cassandra, will also die. That prophecy I spit back in your face. Keep it for yourself. 
This man's wife, his bitter housekeeper, will kill her. May Clytemnestra never be so insane. She'll kill him too, lifting her bloody axe again. Are you out of your mind or just asking for trouble? Kill me if you like, but a bloody bath awaits you still in Argos. You, get this man out of my sight. Oh, did I hit close to home? And gag him too. Go ahead, gag me, I've already spoken. Remove him immediately. Toss him on a desert island where no one has to listen to his insolence. Hecuba, you go and bury your two dead children. The rest of you return to the tents of your masters. It's time to cast off. See how the ship's sails flap and below? The wind is finally blowing. Let us pray for fair weather and safe passage on our voyage. May this be the end of our ordeal. May we find all things well at home, in all our homes. To the harbor now, to the tents. It is time to embark. It is time to board our new lives as slaves. But the taste is bitter. Necessity is hard. So that's the end of a pretty remarkable sequence. And we gave you a, a, a long, unbroken performance um, so the actors could really move through it because the emotional turns, the plot turns, uh, turns are pretty amazing in that section. And I, I wanna sort of move around and talk to everybody here. Uh, but Toph, uh, you've seen this play before, you've done some acting. What's your response to the performances you just saw and the life that was just breathed into this play? I, it's spectacular to see. And I'm going to say uh, Polly Mester uh, was particularly charming and appealing. And um, when, you know, he first comes on, he, he really convinced me that he was uh, sincere and well-meaning. And of course he's playing a role, isn't he? And then he you know, he Hecuba receives all those words and again uses these empty words in response because she too is playing a role in order to lure them in. But I think that really, really came through was uh, the sycophancy between these two former equals uh, as you know, they're going through the diplomatic language, but, um, but, but uh, each with their own agendas that they're not speaking. Yeah, and I think one of the things you brought up in the chat while we were watching it is that these are actors who are acting in the play, right? And really sort of having to layer emotions upon the performances. Um, so uh, let, let's just start with some of the actors so we can get the responses. Yeah. Um, Eunice, we've got to go to Hecuba. Um, every time you come, you not every time you play Hecuba, but you do often. Uh, and this Hecuba it has like multitudes of Hecuba within her. Can you talk a little bit about sort of your process of working through her performance and really what's going on in those la in those final scenes where she's playing a role um, in order to accomplish her aims? Um, I think I mean I think you take it as it comes. You know, um, she doesn't know. She hasn't read the end of the play, um, though I think she probably knows it's not going to turn out hunky dory. Um, <laughs> But, but that's what I mean, you know, you, you, you don't know you're going to be playing, I mean, all the planning going on. And so I, 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 it is just that thing of, it, it, it's like being on a, on a wave or on a ship. And I just think you go with it, you know, sometimes you've got a nice little sort of mill pond and you sort of sail along. And then other time, you know, you're off and you ride it, I think. <laughs> and um, and I I just always I always love in any um, play any text when there is that sort of rhythm going and the music going and you take it off that other person and it's um, you know the sort of stick of media stick or whatever you know um, and just sort of banging off each other and and I and you go I that's that's how I like working. And I just feel this gives you such an opportunity to do that. So with, with Hecuba, uh, if we're thinking of her, trying to think of her as a whole person, she's hit with sort of emotional uh, like 
rockets over and over, right? She loses a child, but when she's rejected by Polyxena, she finds out about Polydorus. When she moves into that last section of the play, and she she herself is playing Polymestor to murder his kids. Um, what's happened to that emotion, to that sorrow? Do you think she's in shock? Is she weaponizing it? Um, it it's bizarre. I mean, it, it might be different if I was actually playing her sort of, you know, night after night or something. I might think something else. But at the moment, what I'm thinking is that there's a sort of emptiness. Mm and almost of not caring that there is, um, you know, she says earlier on in the play that, you know, we're all equal. <laughs> we all should be deserved to be the same. And it's, it's almost inverted into, in which case then we all deserve this hell. Yeah, and I, I, I love that, I love thinking of her as empty um, because Hecuba is someone who, you know, her city was, set under siege for 10 years. She watched endless children die, her son protector Hector. She's been enslaved. Um, she's now watching you know, the, this final end. Um, and then she just turns. I think part of the tone of the end is, is just fascinating because she becomes this avenging spirit of murder. Um, I think it is just all that, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, but and then, but the playing in the end. So Tim, maybe we'll uh, I'll ask you about this now because both you and Eunice are playing characters who are trying to deceive one another, um, and in the face of of her overpowering um, performance, uh, Paula Maester seems kind of dumb. I mean, not, not to put it too yeah. too baldly, um, but I mean he's just, he thinks he's getting away with it, right? What what yeah. what was it like to play that sort of confident? Uh, cheat and then to suddenly turn around to the loss and suffering yeah i mean uh <laughs> it's uh he's like the sort of the, the the most appalling man i mean he's 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 horrendous but it it was really <clears throat> it was really fun very fun to play um the kind of the arrogance as you say the confidence with which he swaggers on to stage and that and the dialogue that he has with Hecuba and the kind of the, the, the self-belief that he he's kind of sailed through life up until this moment um it's just kind of jo it's joyful to play that scene it was joyful to play that scene and, and and I imagine the audience must be just kind of relishing what what they kind of sense is about to happen to him because um he's just vile and he sort of reminds his, his stupidity and arrogance reminds me of you know certain world leaders that we have and kind of you you imagine <laughs> they're sort of uh you know being being kind of cut down to size literally by by all of these women is just kind of glorious really so so you're saying you can imagine paula maester coming out and saying look it's easy if we don't have more tests we won't have more yeah. cases that that's right. kind of what i'm saying yeah yeah <laughs> that's can, simple yeah. I'd like to see that. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, you know, it reminds me of the meme or comment that goes around that, oh, to have the confidence of a mediocre man, right? right. And then <laughs> Billy Wood comes out with his character in this. Uh, exactly. No, I love it. And then, you know, the high drama of, you know, the Oedipus blinding of the eyes and you coming out and complaining, look of how I've been wrong. Um, yeah. that, was that an easy transition to make then, given how much contempt you have for this man? Yeah, I think exactly that. I mean, uh, well, I, I, I don't know. I, the, the kind of the rage within him is, is yeah, it was, it was sort of easy. I, th I think his arrogance, the very fact that he kind of sails through life has this arrogance that the idea that he could be um, brought down uh, in this way, in this manner, I, could I can just imagine that rage coming uh -huh. out. So we can, we I, was can slightly, I, I was slightly concerned. We we have a we have quite thin floorboards, and I <laughs> <laughs> concerned that my neighbours were going to break the door down. The police are going to be knocking any minute yeah. now, right? Yeah. If that yeah. weren't yeah. enough, there's also the misogyny in Polymester as well. It's not just that he's been defeated, but it's that women have have beat him. Yeah, have taken children and blinded him with their dress pins. He hasn't, he, he hasn't even been wounded by a sword. Um, yeah. Though he calls it a sword at one point. Uh, he then yeah. later admits that it's with brooches. And, you know, like he, he's, 
he, he's so deflated. And, and the brooch, and remember the pins, right? That's what your costa, uh, uh, sorry, that's what's used in uh, Oedipus as well, right? Yeah. Uh, which is fascinating. And there's something, there's something timeless and very current about this type of male privilege in the, his rage, right? Mm -hmm. I can't believe this has happened. I can't believe I couldn't get away with murdering a boy and taking all the gold, right? But and sneaking into the women's quarters, like there, there, you know, he 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 thought he might get laid on this trip as well. Like, like there's, there's all sorts of weird things, you know, him getting into the tent with all the slave women before the Greeks get there. Like he is lured in by Hecuba with promise of all sorts of things, uh, none of which well, and, come. And he plays upon his arrogance as the weakness that it is to lure him in and his sons, and is brilliant. Now, part of what really made the scene that I wasn't expecting was the chorus. And we've talked before about how the Euripidean chorus is weird. It challenges us. But Tamika, this time, I don't know how you guys planned this, but this is another one of those. This is cinematic. Like, it was brilliant to move your face closer and to get in. But you were gleeful. Like, you were, you were really her ally and cheering her on. How did that come around? And how did that feel? It was a choice. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, in, you know, being, being enslaved with Hecuba and, and me being one person playing multiple people, multiple women within this course, um, I, when we read it the day before yesterday, um, we just talked about the different levels and the different, um, perspectives that, the chorus, even though in solidarity as the, the Trojan women, as enslaved women, um, is allowing each of the voices to be heard. Hmm. And I mean, the, the, your facial expressions, the, your, ton your tonality there um, really brought out the sort of the perverse but enjoyable revenge fantasy aspect of the end of this play. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I can see like an entire sequence of memes based on your expressions. Right. Mm -hmm. About about this. Like, yeah, we're going to murder people now. Like, here mm -hmm. we go. And this is good. Um, and it was it was just great. Uh, so far, this is my favorite chorus ever, um, just cool. because of the way you guys treated it. Right. Uh, it's something really new in, in this. Um, so sort of dialing back a, a bit in the play to some of the other characters. Um, let's let's go back to Evie as Polyxena for a minute. Uh, so uh, Top already talked about Polyxena's sort of strange um, acquiescence, quick acquiescence, almost desire to die. Um, how did that compare to some of the other characters that you that you've read for us over the past few weeks? It's interesting. I I feel like there's been a lot of um, I've read quite a lot of characters that are confronted with their immediate demise um, <laughs> as their kind of fate and destiny, and it's interesting to see how different people cope with that or deal with that and it was really interesting what you said Toph about how, how it was um you know maybe she's let Hecuba down and 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 maybe it's just because as an actor you always fight for your characters um but I think I don't know I suppose if she knows she's gonna die she's seen the might of this army she's seen the a total destruction of her city her sisters her father her brothers she knows that if they want to kill her they're going to. And I don't know, it felt like maybe there was something for Hecuba possibly to watch her daughter walk away with dignity and her head held high rather than dragged away screaming. Um, but yeah. I think there was a, there's a real similarity between the Cassandra um, mm. we read in the Trojan Women recently, um, that kind of open armed acceptance of death and the certainty of kind of you know, re being reunited in Hades with people that you love and have lost. Um, and that's brave. I mean, I think, you know, that's brave. It's it's really, I think it's, I think it's kind of admirable um, to, to be confronted with that and to just take it and go, yeah. You brought, you brought a boldness and strength to it um, that I didn't see in the character when I read it. Um, because, you know, she just seems to acquiesce so quickly. And that's not a criticism. It definitely made me see the character more. And then Toss' uh, view of this as being a type of weakness made me think of that uh, Japanese proverb that's quoted a lot in the Wheel of Time series. Um, and that's that uh, death is lighter than a, than a feather, right? And, and uh, duty's heavier than a mountain, right? So there are times when it looks noble to take death, right? To face death. 
when you're really getting out of a harder road, right? And that's one of the themes of this play, right? It's um, uh, Hecuba herself who says that no one of us is free, right? At all, like we are servants to different types of things. We are constrained. And I think it's amazing that Hecuba is the one to voice this because she has someone who's had the maximum amount of power with also the maximal amount of restraint, right? A woman who's been married to a man who had multiple consorts, giving birth constantly, living in a beautiful city under siege for most of her life, and whose life has been judged by the whims of the men around her, right? And so she's really like the backstory of this figure is, is powerful. Um, so uh, I think that's, if, I, if I can just cut in, yeah. I think that's really important to remember. Um, this is one of the this this would have been the first play if you were a Byzantine school kid. This would have been the first real tragedy that you would have read. It was like the Macbeth, uh, you know, in, in your high school equivalent. And medieval thought does a lot with Hecuba, but it's this Hecuba that it's using. It's you know this this sort of uh, the 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 wheel of fate and how much your life can be upended. Um, Hecuba, you know, starts the play having been queen in the bottom enslaved. And what we see is we see the wheel turning back up as she tries to reassert herself. And I think accomplishing that uh, by the end of the play. I think she really does too. So and, yeah. um, I wanna get back to that. Um, and especially the weird prophecy at the end, which colors things a little differently. But I do wanna to talk to Taj and, and Carlos first. So Taj, your Odysseus completely challenged me uh, because I hate Odysseus. But you, you're younger, you're handsome, and you played him as like so dutiful and serious, and I couldn't hate you. So what were you bringing to the character um, as Odysseus? What were you thinking about his words? Yeah, um, you know, in the beginning, I had a, a really difficult time you know, separating the differences between myself and, and Odysseus and, and, you know, the quote, give a man, any man can overcome adversity, but give a man power is the, you know, a true test of character. Just seeing, I, I was really looking at the, the difference in Hecuba versus me in those positions. And it's, you know, it's really easy for a, a lowly man to beg than for a person in position to lend. So I had to kind of convince myself that what I believed was true. And I had to really believe it so that I could play that earnestly, so I could justify it to myself that these words I'm speaking are true, that I am going to, this choice is going to inspire men and that I've seen this work before and I know it will work again um, conceptually. So like, I just, I had to have the, I had to convince myself very hard which is maybe why you felt that. <laughs> no, and I, I did because look, because I'm used to Odysseus being sketchy, right? He's shifty, he's always deceiving people. Um, but if you seem shifty and deceptive, you're not gonna be that successful. So right. as, you pulled it off in a way and you, I, I, by underplaying him, I think you made him like a convincing and real persona in this play, right? Because he's got a job to do, right? Mm -hmm. And he's gonna carry it off with minimal suffering for himself. And right. you really did that. And so thank you. I thank you because, uh, you know, yeah, I'm used to an old Odysseus, like a scrappy guy who's like winking. Um, but, you, but you really, you really changed my mind about him. Um, Car Carlos, uh, your Agamemnon had me laughing, not because you were funny, but just because like you, you seemed like a serious, upright Agamemnon who has his shit together, which is not always the way it is with Agamemnon. So what, what was running through your mind? What were sort of your goals in characterizing him? Well, um, I try to think about politics and in a way you need to know things always. And in this case, I try to have fun uh, and try to play the character that Agamemnon didn't knew what was happening, but he knew from the beginning because he talked with Hecuba and it was uh, how, Agamemnon will talk like trying to be serious, but knowing what's going to happen, you know? So it's like, you come and I say, oh, I hear something. Uh, oh, there's a bloody scene. Uh, and I, I try to put my, my poker face that I'm going to be fair with both of them. But at the end, it's just a play in a way for me too. And, and also at the end, the winds 
starts flowing and it's like, okay, this is what I'm really invested to happen. And yeah, for me, it was trying to have fun. How could a, a, politic, a politician in this way, how, how can he play with people with the information? And in a way it happens in real life. I appreciate that, especially it had the sense at the end that like Agamemnon had a good day. He was yeah. good, right? But the interesting thing is like everybody in the audience is hearing the narr narrator's voice, which was, it's not going to be a good day for him tomorrow, right? Because everything's going to be bad. But it's, it's interesting that Euripides gives Agamemnon this win and you really, you carried it off with a panache um, that, re that was really convincing, right? Again, acting the roles like the others, but also like taking over this position, like I'm going to be a good judge, I'm going to be a good leader, um, and being a little chill about it. So I, I think it, it was really it was a good it was a good role. Um, so the end of the play, Toph, if you can sort of tell us a little bit about it, it's filled with predictions yeah, well, of what will happen. It is, and I think it's worth may, maybe going backwards through these predictions. Okay. First off, Agamemnon decides that he's going to leave uh, Polymester on an island uh, because that will shut him up. That's exactly the decision that was made on the way to Troy with Philoctetes, and that didn't work out. So I, I think we're even laughing at that punishment for Polymester. Um, but in, in those final lines, Agamemnon is told that he's going to die by his wife with an axe in a bath. This is the death that he's going to receive, not in the mythic tradition generally, but it's specifically in Aeschylus. Mm -hmm. It's Aeschylus' Oresteia. He's told the plot of Agamemnon a week and a half before Agamemnon is set to happen. And because we know Agamemnon happens, we know that he hasn't fully processed what's going on and good old dumb Agamemnon is gonna happily walk through and not realize that, hey, I've been told that I should be wary about baths and axes and Cassandra. Um, so uh, we get this sense that Euripides is sort of anticipating the Oresteia. It's not gonna affect the Oresteia, but, but he wants to call our attention to it. And for me, that's the way to make sense of the very weird dog prophecy, because uh, you know to turn into a dog with blazing eyes um, is an unexpected thing for an old lady, uh, but it is you know who's in her seventies or 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 whatever it is we're expecting to think her uh, th think she is. As, as soon as it mentions, she even cuts Polymester off asking if she's going to grow wings because the thought of her climbing a mast just seems so improbable. But I think the wings are important because we've got a dog, we've got wings, we've got burning, we've got revenge. All of those are symbols, as somebody has said in the chat, of the Furies. And I think that's exactly right. She is becoming this supernatural spirit of revenge. She is becoming a fury and an Iskalian fury who is in charge of the, uh, you know, the, the righteous enactment of DK, of justice. Um, what she has done to Polymester is seen as being right. Um, Agamemnon judges it right. Even Polymester says <laughs> that, that He's, what, what's happened is right. You know, he admits that he's killed the kid and he's deserving of punishment. He was just being, you know, uh, selfish and, and trying to get away with it. So uh, seeing her not as being punished by this metamorphosis, I think is actually the way the ancient Greeks would have seen it. We're, we're being drawn into an Oresteia world here. We're uh, associating them with the furies of righteous revenge. And like Polixenus, she is avoiding a life as a slave. Um, she doesn't have to suffer indignities, uh, sl uh, slaving away for some other Greek. Uh, she, she's out of the picture and she's going to be memorialized. And uh, there's going to be a landmass. And it's a landmass that 10 years later is going to be important in the Peloponnesian War, as it turns out. But it's, it's a known landmark, uh, Kinosima. Uh, that Euripides is, you know, integrating here in order to uh, sort of ground Hecuba's death, I think, um, into something that isn't a punishment, that isn't a debasement of her, is in fact, it's an ennobling of her. Um, we only know of one other predicted metamorphosis in tragedy. 
I think. Uh, and that's of Cadmus uh, in the Bacchae. And he's going to become a snake. And if he's being punished, it's certainly not for anything that he's done in the play. He's, he's behaved ritually correct throughout. So I, I think we, uh, it's possible to over-translate it as the bitch with burning eyes. That, that's certainly what Polymester is feeling. But it's not that the play is condemning Hecuba. And I think Hecuba um, is actually being ennobled by this prophecy. And uh, I mean, I, I totally buy that, right? She becomes a deity of vengeance. Um, and there are also, I think, some deep um, uh, resonances with sort of underworld worship, right? Death worship, some Hecate might be there with dog sacrifices. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it's really powerful. She transcends to another plane. Um, and if we're going to associate the Trojans with Spartans and look out into the world, is there a warning here, right? Are, are we supposed to take something away or is this just a wild ride? Yeah, I think it's a wild ride. I think almost everybody has used speech uh, for um, secret means. Quite often in Greek tragedy, people are saying what they're thinking. This is a play where there is deception going on in the words. Um, people are speaking. Uh, the audience is aware that they're, they're, they're acting or playing roles or not showing all their cards the characters aren't coming out and saying, I'm not showing all my cards when I say this. Um, and if anything, maybe the association is, is with the rise of the demagogues that we start to see in the late 420s, that it's, it's actually about the power of patho, of persuasion. There's a speech about persuasion. That was one of the occupations of the uh, sophists as well, that you learn how to persuade with words regardless of the truth. And, and that persuasive speech isn't necessarily tied to truth, but to effective rhetoric. And absolutely everyone seems to be using effective rhetoric. And, and I mean, Hecuba's words here are so, are so loaded when she says that someone shouldn't have a stronger tongue than action, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, and that's really interesting because what does that, how does that reflect on the genre of tragedy and performance to begin with? Right, it sort of becomes this sort of puzzle that collapses on itself. Um, Paul and Emma, I want to ask you a bit about about this play. Paul, you've worked through a lot of these plays. Um, how how do you feel about the complexity of the characterization and the use of language in Euripides, especially this play, compared to some of the others we've done? And um, I, I think one of the things that really kind of um, came out um, with this, and something that's been touched on um, a bit already, is just how how much people are playing roles within it. And it's just so interesting to see them take on those, those different mantles at different times. And obviously you get to see more of that with Hecuba, but even those people who are just sort of coming on you know, for one particular moment, you still see them kind of play in certain roles. And I think that it's sort of, yeah, it's, it's actors playing characters who are then playing versions of themselves. And that becomes really kind of, that's really interesting. And I think it brings a lot of humor out as well, actually. I, I mean, I found that the opening of um, the, the Polymestor and Hecuba scene, it's, it's really funny, you know, for me. I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot that we kind of relish partly to do with the fact that we don't, don't like him in any way whatsoever. Um, and I thought that, uh, that something kind of connected with that as well is, and it's something that se seems to come up again and again is how all these people who are in charge, you know, sort of the, the leaders of the, the Greek forces in this case, and you kind of think they're going to have it all together. They've got it all worked out. But actually, they're all, they're all sort of busking it at different points. And actually, it feels a lot of the time like they are trying, sort of they're leading, but also they're just, they're trying to kind of catch which way the wind is blowing, no pun intended on this one, about sort of, well, actually, what do the people want from me? I've got a reputation to maintain. I want to keep everyone on my side. And yeah, I'm the leader, but do you want to give us a steer on which way you want me to lead you? Um, and I think that that's something that is sort of explored more and more with these powerful, um, powerful men that often come on stage. And I, I like that because we have to remember that everybody meets terrible fates and the only one who really survives is Odysseus. And he's the one in the play who's most accused of using manipul manipulative language, but he seems to be just sort of a, the straight man. 
right? Um, which is one of the most enigmatic but clear Odysseuses uh, we see on the stage. Emma, um, to sort of close us out, uh, which Euripides play is your favorite and why is it this one? <laughs> I, oh, you're killing me there. <laughs> um, no, you're good. This, this play is, is actually like in my top three for Euripides. So I thankfully don't have to, you know, Bacchae aside. Um, this play is for me, and part of the what went into the kind of scene selection this week, this play is, and Toph really mentioned something here that kind of codified this for me. This play is what's on the other side of despair. Like this, for, for so many different characters in this play, this is, you know, what happens if you hit rock bottom? Do you keep digging or do you turn into something else? And for Polixena, it's this like grim acceptance and she almost finds strength in that. And this nobility that is this selfishness that's so complicated and weird and messy. And for Hecuba, it turns into this bitter, angry, strong vengeance. And for Polymester, it turns into, you know, he goes through despair into this kind of almost Oedipus Tiresias like prophetic moment. Like he actually reaches something else on the other side of all of this grief and loss and despair. And it's so interesting. And the talking about um, Hecuba kind of attaining these fury like characteristics really brought that home for me that like this play is what happens when you break through, break through despair and, and what's on the other side. I like that. So the, the tagline for the play is, is, you know, what do you do when you have nothing left but revenge? Um, <laughs> and you're, you're, you're Hecuba. Um, so uh, tomorrow, if you love this play, which many of us do, uh, there'll be a live reading of it again tomorrow, 7 p.m. Mountain Time by Relative the Theatrics. Um, and you can see it it on their Facebook page, Relative Theatrics, uh, to sort of sign up for it. I want to give a special thanks to the translators that uh, put together this play today, um, Jay Carden and Laura Gray Street. Um, this is a really lively and, and sort of modern translation, um, and I found it really effective. Um, as uh, usual, uh, with a bunch of people to thank, before closing completely, I want to remind everybody that we'll be back together next week at 3 p.m. on Wednesday um, with Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound, um, which has a tone and flavor just a little different from what we get from um, Euripides. Uh, our uh, performance and uh, gathering is made possible by a crew of people. I want to uh, talk about John Coyley for a second. His posters are great. He did an alternate, an alternate poster this day, basically Hecuba, kill, kill. Um, but we also have a crew uh, helping us out. Lana, Ali, uh, Ali uh, Janet, Ellen, Sarah, Keith, um, everybody who's making this possible. Thank you. We'll see you again next week at 3 p.m. Stay safe and uh, read some Aeschylus. <laughs>